Anger corrodes relationships, and it eats away at the person who harbors anger. It's been said, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. The team of Gilbert and Sullivan, here on the left, is well known in the music world. From 1871 to 1896, they collaborated to produce 14 operettas together. Gilbert's words meshed with Sullivan's music to audiences' delight. You think, what a team, right? Wrong. The two men detested each other. It all started over a property matter, go figure. Sullivan ordered some carpet for the theater they bought. When Gilbert saw the bill, he hit the roof. Neither man could control his temper, and so they found themselves battling it out in court. They never spoke to one another again as long as they lived. This then is how it worked. When Sullivan wrote the music for a new production, he mailed it to Gilbert. After Gilbert had written the words, he mailed it back to Sullivan. Once they were forced to be together during a curtain call, but they stood on opposite sides of the stage and bowed in different directions so that they wouldn't see each other. How sad. They knew how to make beautiful music, but had lost the key to true harmony. As we continue today to look at Jesus' magnificent Sermon on the Mount, we find he counsels us to go deeper than keeping the letter of the law when it comes to interacting with those who may differ from us. Murderous intentions start in the heart, but can be overcome if we recognize the importance of self-control, reconciliation, keeping short accounts. Christ has just underlined the enduring quality of God's special revelation in Scripture, verses 17 to 20 of Matthew 5, saying he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, calling people to a righteousness surpassing that of the religious leaders, putting God's commands into practice. He goes on in the next six sections to show he himself is Lord of the Scriptures. Beyond the bare minimum of what they've heard taught by their rabbis and the burdensome interpretations that have been added on over the years, he he calls his disciples to recognize the spirit of the law, not just the letter of the law. Matthew 5.21 You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Exactly. This was right in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Note the word murder is distinguishable from several other Hebrew and Greek words meaning kill. No one has the right to take another person's life, not even in the womb, disabled, or at the end of life by lethal injection. Jesus goes deeper to examine our impulses that even if never acted upon, Dispose us to treat others abusively or with contempt. Matthew 5.22, next verse. But I tell you, Jesus says, that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You see here various degrees of expression of a common disposition. Anyone who is angry with his brother. Next, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, literally empty, or we might say, numbskull, blockhead. You can probably think of some other choice ones. Third, anyone who says, you fool, uh, go back to the verse here, you fool, uh, the Greek moros, what word comes to mind? You think of moron, moron, yeah. Commentator Bruce notes the term raka shows contempt for the person's head, as in calling them stupid, whereas the moros term, you fool, uh, shows contempt for their heart and character, as in saying, you scoundrel. There's a slam to their morality, not just their intelligence. Jesus emphasizes that regardless of degree of contempt, all three impulses warrant judgment. The first, mere anger, makes one subject to judgment, he says. The second is answerable to the Sanhedrin, Jewish equivalent of our Supreme Court. 
The third expression of contempt, you fool, puts one in danger of the fire of hell. Literally, Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem. Sorry, the elders don't like me preaching hellfire and brimstone, but Jesus does, so I'm saying you're in danger of the fire of hell. So it's there in the text. What can I do? In this valley, back in the times of Ahaz and Manasseh, fiery altars consumed human sacrifices. It was really gruesome. They had these stone statues like this. People would allow their infants to roll down the arms of the statues representing the foreign god Molech into the flames at the base of the statue. How terrible. How devilish. However, if you think about it today, a million aborted every year in the United States, some of that by saline abortion where they inject salt in and the baby literally burns with the salt solution. It often. Later reforms desecrated the area of this valley of him, turning it into a public latrine and in following times a sort of garbage dump where sporadic fires burned. Yeah, you've been to enough dumps where there's fires from time to time. So it became a symbol <coughs> of eternal punishment in hell. That's the term Gehenna. Now, it's all too common a human experience to become angry at another person. We're, we're tempted to object to Jesus' words, arguing anyone who's angry with his brother is too restrictive, too harsh. Now, some manuscripts, if you note the little uh, in your NIV, if it is, there was a little letter B saying, brother without cause. Some manuscripts try to insert uh, anyone who is angry without, to, with his brother without cause will be subject to judgment. But the best manuscript evidence suggests Jesus did not include those two significant words without cause when he was originally preaching. Perhaps he was using hyperbole, uh, overemphasis, to grab our attention. Certainly his point becomes clearer in the second and third steps. Anger that gets expressed as in verbal abuse, calling others blockhead or moron in a degrading, contemptuous way. Popular wisdom today is all in favor of maximum self-expression, articulating your emotions, getting it off your chest. You may think you're better off when you tell someone off, but research compiled by psychologist Gary Emery suggests you're actually not. In his book, Rapid Relief from Emotional Distress, Emery reports, although a whole school of thought recommends that you verbally express your hostility, a great deal of recent research has found the opposite to be the case. Researchers have found that freely venting your anger corrodes relationships and breeds more anger, not less. In one recent study, only one out of 300 happily married couples reported that they yell at each other. Only one out of 300 happily married couples yell at each other. Yet it comes so easily to be angry with someone, especially your spouse. It's human nature. When we feel we've been wrong, we react. Isn't anger part of God's nature? There are many verses in the Bible about God's anger or wrath. Here are a few. Psalm 7 11. God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his what? Wrath, wrath every day. Now, uh, this is a typo. It should be Psalm 90 11, and I put the wrong verse in. The right verse, Psalm 90 11, says, Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Psalm 9:11, Lamentations 4:11, and think of the context of Lamentations: the city of Jerusalem destroyed by the Babylonians is laid waste. The Lord has given full vent to His what? Wow. He has poured out His fears what? Anger. Anger. Yeah. He kindled the fire in Zion that consumed her foundations. Coming to the New Testament. Lest you think this is just an Old Testament idea, or that there's some inconsistency between the God of the Old Testament and that of the New Testament. Romans 1.18, one of our favorite New Testament books. What's it say? Let's read this one all together. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Is God angry at wickedness? Undoubtedly, yes. Colossians 3.6, uh, because of these, 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed. Certain movies with Fifty Shades in the title come to mind here. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Revelation. uh, Sorry, right to the last book of the Bible here. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls. Picture these seven big bowls getting dumped out, filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Jesus here, in the next one, is pictured as working out the fury of God's wrath. Jesus himself, Revelation 19, out of his mouth, Jesus' mouth, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the, what is that? Wrath of God Almighty. So what gives? What's the deal here? God gets to be angry, but not us? That doesn't seem right. It's not fair. Aren't we supposed to be imitating God? Doesn't Paul the Apostle implicitly give us permission to be angry just a little bit? In Ephesians 4.26, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. But there's a big difference here. A. He is God and we're not. He is the creator, the judge, the one to whom everyone must someday give account. You are not your brother or sister or your spouse's ultimate judge. Sorry to break it to you. Don't suppose you can usurp God's privilege, God's right. And B, there's a big difference between angry at wickedness versus being angry at a person. We should be upset at unrighteousness and evil. God's wrath is against godlessness and wickedness, Romans 1.18. That doesn't give you carte blanche to become your brother or sister's grand inquisitor, judge, and jury. So we find this tension in the Bible. It's appropriate and fitting for God to be angry and express his wrath, because he is God and cannot tolerate sin, because he's holy. Yet for us, the New Testament calls us to resist the temptation to get angry and express angry reactions. Galatians 5, 19-21 fits of rage is listed in the acts of the sinful nature, the acts of the flesh, deeds of the flesh, characterizing those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Colossians 3, 8, just two verses after noting God's coming wrath, Paul writes, let's read this one together. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Anger and rage, right in there. Rid yourself of those things. Likewise, Ephesians 4.31, very parallel to Colossians. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Anger is a very natural response in some situations. But God's Spirit helps us have the fruit of patience, long-fusedness, gentleness, and self-control. For parents, anger is never to become rage that energizes punishment and discipline. For spouses, anger is never to be allowed to be expressed in words sharp as daggers or looks that could kill or doors that slam, communicating volumes even if we don't say a word. Um, Maybe think about anger as a sort of dash light or idiot bulb, you know those idiot bulbs in in front of your steering wheel there. We're um, going to the Casting Crowns concert on uh, Tuesday night and we have a 2001 Saturn that's got horn rings, and so I have to add oil every couple of Phillips. So, anyway, sitting at the border, waiting to go up to the border people, and the oil light comes on. So, oh, oh, I better get some oil. So we did, uh, after we had supper, and put the oil in, and okay, fine. And on the way back, on the Canadian side, waiting for the border, and again, the oil light comes on. So that tells me... I may need to check a little more into this. I should have looked at the dipstick first, probably. And, uh, anyway, anger is a, a, an idiot bulb saying, hey, something you need to check out here. What's going on? 
So what do you do when you feel anger rising up within? How do you stop it from spilling out into words like blockhead and moron? Part of it is taking a deep breath and remembering God is God, you are not. Let go of the scepter of divine eternal judgment which does not belong in your hands. Thomas Jefferson said, When angry, count ten before you speak. If very angry, one hundred. <laughs> Fulton Arsler wrote a classic book on the life of Christ, the greatest story ever told. Arsler's wife once said she used to count to ten when becoming provoked. But one day, she thought of the first ten words of the Lord's Prayer. Now, instead of counting to ten, she slowly says, and you can say it with me, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's a good point. Next time you're angry, think about that. Remembering God is sovereign, we can open the valve and allow the pressure of our anger to slowly dissipate. He is God. I'm not. Scripture repeatedly commands us to be slow to anger, not quick to fly off the handle. Proverbs 16.32 Better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes the city. Titus 1.7 Since an overseer, talking about elders, leaders in the church, is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. And James 1. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be, what? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For, he gives us a reason, man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. When it comes to human relationships, Jesus made a tight connection between how we treat one another and how we can expect God to treat us. When asked about the greatest commandment, Jesus said it was about loving God with our whole being. And in the same breath, quickly linked to that the command to love our neighbor as ourselves. He said no other command is greater than these two, and they kind of go together. Another pivotal teaching is the Lord's Prayer, featured later in this same Sermon on the Mount. At the heart of the Lord's Prayer, we find the phrase, Matthew 6, 12, Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And in case we missed it, immediately after that prayer, Jesus says, Matthew 6, 14, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. See how closely he's making the connection between how we treat others and how we can hope for God to treat us. The priority of keeping short accounts, of maintaining good relationships with other people, comes through clearly in verses 23 to 26 of Matthew 5. Jesus seems to be saying resolving outstanding issues with other people is as important sort of prerequisite to being able to adequately worship God. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then, come and offer your gift. Amazing, yes? There's no divorcing your church life and your community life. Your Sunday worship from your Thursday workplace. God sees it all. And when you come to worship Him, He wants you to not have outstanding issues with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, your co-workers. He doesn't want the gift in your right hand if your left hand is clenched behind your back holding on to some grudge against a perceived enemy or trying to maintain your innocence against someone who has something against you. Perceives correctly or otherwise, that you've wronged them somehow. God only wants your offering after you've gone and sorted things out. It's a matter of urgency. First go, settle matters quickly, Jesus says, and of gravity. This is serious stuff with significant consequences. Verses 25-26, Jesus says, Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way. Or he may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. 
tell you the truth, you'll not get out until you've paid the last penny. That term penny translates the word for one quarter of the basic Roman small coin. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul castigates those in the church who are taking each other to court over certain matters. Settling matters between themselves would spare Christ's name disrepute. It's far better, Paul says, to make amends and clear things up just among themselves, even if it means taking a loss materially. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Paul says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? John MacArthur notes, it's better to be wrong than to allow a dispute between brethren to dishonor Christ. So, congregational meeting. Let's be deciding but not disputing. An illustration for the world of sports in closing. In the 1975 Masters Tennis Tournament in Stockholm, Sweden, tennis star Arthur Ashe on the right uh, was winning a feverish battle with Romanian-born Ili Nastasi, sometimes dubbed Nasty Nastasi, for his flamboyant on-court antics. Nastasi was at his worst this day, stalling, cursing, taunting, and acting like a madman. Finally, Arthur Ashe put down his racket and walked off the court, saying, I've had enough. I'm at the point where I'm afraid I'll lose control. The umpire cried, But Arthur, you'll default the match. Ashe replied, I don't care. I'd rather lose that than my self-respect. The next day, the tournament committee came to a surprising solution. Refusing to condone Nastasi's bullying tactics, they insisted that Nastasi default the match for his unsportsmanlike conduct. Arthur Ashe won both in the game of tennis and in the game of life. That's great. 